Gigabyte and their flagship hardware division, Aorus, always deliver something pretty special when it comes to their latest motherboards. The latest X670E Aorus Master motherboard comes with support for the latest AMD Ryzen 7000 series of processors, including X3D, the latest DDR5 memory technology, and PCIe Gen 5 storage devices. So it should deliver some pretty fantastic performance. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. Hello mate, you all right? Yeah, just got all the bits from my banging new gaming PC. Just got to put it together. It's going to be so much better than yours. Oh, right. What did you get then? The latest Intel 12th gen processor, a feature patched motherboard and 32 gig of DDR4 memory. See, miles ahead of yours. <laughs> you, you realize that board needs DDR5 memory, don't you? Don't tell me you went and bought the wrong stuff. DDR4 is so 2014. I can't believe you was that stupid. <gasps> what? No, you're joking. What should I get then? For me, I'd be looking at Corsair's newest Vengeance DDR5 kits, or if you're wanting that all important RGB, then go for the Dominator Platinum RGB. Oh, you are a lifesaver, thanks. But where can I find out more? By clicking the link in the description below, of course. <laughs> and you call me the stupid one. So the Aorus Master, it's one of the most high-end motherboards in the Aorus lineup, with only the extreme sitting above it. And as such, it's going to be quite expensive. However, all that extra money isn't just going into thin air, as you get significantly upgraded components and build quality, giving it more of a robust power delivery, cooling, stability, and connectivity for high performance systems. Of course, such high-end hardware isn't for, well, everyone. I mean, it is very, very niche. But if you do want a lot of high-end storage and overclocking potential, as well as extremely potent networking capabilities, well then, it kind of looks like the Aorus Master has what you desire. So let's start by talking about the packaging. The box is nice and large and very durable. So the rather heavy motherboard within is certainly well protected. We can see it's DDR5 too, as all AM4 boards only support DDR5, unlike Intel, which supports either DDR4 or DDR5, depending on the board that you go for. Around the back is a nice breakdown of the main features, including some unique ones and a first glimpse of the power delivery, along with a map of the rear IO and the key specs of the board. Now, I will come kind of straight out and say it, this motherboard looks absolutely stunning and surprisingly kind of brighter than most these days. Rather than just kind of stealthy black design that most brands are actually going for, a lot of the hardware has a gorgeous grey brushed aluminium finish that should provide an interesting contrast in your next PC build. There's a healthy dose of RGB thrown in too, but features kind of a more tasteful design overall. There's also a ton of M.2 slots with one PCIe Gen 5 slot at the top and a further three below the first X16 slot, of which one of them is Gen 5 ready, while the other two have Gen 4 support, all covered by more covers. Of course, all of these covers aren't just for show as it's all there to act as cooling and protection for kind of everything from the storage bays to the VRMs. Now, I won't lie, it's a heavy motherboard because of this, but it should mean it can take a significant amount of heat from the major hardware and keep it performing at its best. Even at the back, a huge backplate keeps the board rigid and again, adds more surface area for cooling. So I am actually expecting good things from it in terms of VRM temperatures, which we will get to a little bit later on. In terms of branding, along with the Aorus logo, there's a Team Up Fight On slogan in the top left M.2 heatsink, keeping the Aorus tradition of kind of slightly cringy words on products. But overall, it's pretty cool. The heatsink sits just beneath the top PCIe 5X16 slot, but there are two more slots below it for add-in cards, meaning they shouldn't cover up any usable slots or get in the way. Also, the top X16 slot has got shielded armor on there for just a little bit more protection. The Master does take its power delivery pretty seriously, featuring a twin 16 plus 2 plus 2 digital VRM design, which features 105 amp smart power stages and an 8 layer 2x copper PCB, and is all powered by dual 8 pin solid power connectors. So it should be able to pull off some pretty serious power when it's needed, like when overclocking. Now the VRM heatsink is pretty significant too, with their latest Finzer A3 design and a nano carbon coating for additional cooling performance. On the underside, there's a set of thermal pads and it's topped with an aluminium IO cover, which again adds a small amount of RGB. The cable is for hooking up the RGB on the top and making everything look nice. 
The VRMs are divided into 16 V-Core phases rated at 105 amps each in an 8 plus 8 phase parallel power design, along with two SOC phases rated at 90 amps each and two miscellaneous phases which are also rated at 90 amps each. So it all seems pretty hefty on paper and when you break the board down you can see kind of a lot of thought has gone into the board in terms of features, layout and cooling. And while a motherboard doesn't give you extra performance per se, it's always worth checking to make sure that the results line up with kind of where we'd expect it to be based on the comparisons with other boards that use the same chipset. To test, we threw the board onto our test bench with the Ryzen 9 7900X along with 32 gig of Corsair Dominator Platinum 5200 MHz memory. We also used a Seagate Firecuda 530 1TB drive to alleviate any bottlenecks along with a Palette RTX 3080 GameRock OC. The NZXT Kraken Z73 RGB cooler is used to keep our CPU temperatures at bay and our complete system is housed in an NZXT H7 flow with all side panels installed to simulate real world usage, especially when looking at VRM temperatures. The entire system is powered by the NZXT C1000 Gold power supply and Windows 11 Pro 21H2 is used for all of our testing. So let's jump into some numbers. In our synthetic test, we find all of the boards tested delivered roughly the same amount in terms of performance, which is a good thing as this is more of a test for unwanted bottlenecks rather than seeing who comes in first, as the margin is so small between each board anyway. As we move through our testing, we do see some variance with the Aorus Master coming in with a decent super pie score. Though again, in percentage terms, there really isn't much in it, but it does go to show that our CPU has no bottlenecks and that VRM setup is doing its job. Other tests again, just to make sure that the results consistently fall where we'd expect them to, do exactly that when looking at Cinebench and ADA64 memory bandwidth and latency tests, where the Aorus Master sits kind of somewhere in the middle of the seven total boards that we tested. Then in gaming, across four of the most popular titles that have been released over the last couple of years, we again see consistently strong performance in most, though it does fall to the bottom of our results in both Cyberpunk and Horizon Zero Dawn. But with less than a 2% margin between them, I chalk it up as margin of error and retesting could give stronger or even worse performance on all of the X670 e boards tested. So with the, let's say, somewhat useless tests out of the way, as they don't really show much other than making sure that a board performs within the range that we expect, which is then based on the other boards we test against, I guess you could say that the Aorus Master did that and it passed. So with that out of the way, we can actually look at something that does differ board to board, and that comes down to boot times. We all know that AM5 as a platform has some, uh, let's say, issues due to the time that it takes for memory training. But it's here where the Aorus Master blew the competition away, booting 50% faster than the next fastest board. Kind of putting it into perspective, there are more expensive boards taking a significant time to boot into Windows. So this is from when you first turn it on as a cold boot to the first instance of Windows. And considering the amount of features that this board has, I'm pretty impressed with it. Now, another area that makes all of the difference are the VRM temperatures, where I was expecting good things anyway due to the layout and the cooling on this board. And with all X670E baseboards performing pretty well, the Aorus Master with K-type probes fitted to various points on the back of the board shows that it's right up in the mix, coming in with a load temperature of 45 degrees during a sustained one hour Prime 95 test. Now, what's worth noting is that the only two boards that actually perform better than the Aorus Master in terms of VRM temperatures are much more expensive extreme boards from both Gigabyte and Asus. During the VRM testing, we also took the power consumption figures and it's actually pretty good too, coming in a lot lower than expected and comes in lower than most of the competition, including the ASUS ROG Extreme, kind of putting it right on the money. What this means for running costs of the total system is that in both the US and the UK, the lower power consumption results in a slightly cheaper cost to run, only being beaten by another Aorus board and a lower end and kind of less feature packed ASUS board. So the Aorus Master, in typical fashion, didn't disappoint, though for the money you'd expect it to be right up there anyway, as it's available right now for $489.99 in the US and £489.98p in the UK, which I'll be honest, is a lot. But overall, this isn't your typical motherboard. It features extensive cooling and power delivery enhancements, tons of features and a robust I.O. that kind of most gaming builds won't even need. But if you care about those things, you honestly do get what you pay for. 
Still, it's a bargain compared to the rather fantastic Aorus Extreme, which currently retails for $699 in the US and £699 in the UK. But again, you'd like to think you get what you pay for, at least to some degree. Now, when it comes to high-end motherboards, I'm a big fan and longtime user of Gigabyte. Admittedly, Aorus ones are often a bit rich for my blood personally, but overall, I really like kind of what they do as a brand. The build quality, the performance, and the overall aesthetics just seem to, I don't know, tick all of the right boxes. And I'm certain I'm not alone in this regard. However, given the performance is largely on par with models that cost sometimes half as much, why would anyone spend the best part of £500, $500 on something like the Aorus X670E Master? Well, it depends on what you're doing with your PC. I mean, if you want to have your CPU sitting at max boost for a significant amount of time, or if you want to push it further with high overclocks, then the master's bigger VRM setup is going to help you achieve that. You can push your CPU, your memory, your storage, and your GPU harder for kind of a little bit longer on high-end motherboards while still maintaining stability and reliability. And that's kind of what you pay for. So if you do want to stretch the legs of your components, that's why you need a higher end motherboard because stock performance wise, I think we showed there really isn't that much in it. Furthermore, with the latest DDR5, PCIe5 and AM5 support, all of the kind of latest and greatest hardware is supported too, including those two PCIe Gen 5 M.2 connectors. So you'll have no shortage of fast storage and they all come with huge heat sinks too. There's high-end audio as well, thanks to the fantastic ALC1220 codec, as well as DTS-X Ultra Processing for hi-fi audio. Networking speeds will be fast as well, thanks to the Intel 2.5 GBE LAN and Intel Wi-Fi 6E. And then there's the plethora of lightning fast USB ports with USB 4 support as well. It really, I don't know, just seems to have it all. But yeah, should you buy one? That's, I guess, the big question. Well, being honest, this is likely more motherboard than most people need. And the additional cooling and power delivery hardware will only really benefit flagship CPUs that are being run hard for rendering or gaming and other CPU intensive tasks for longer periods. Or of course, as I mentioned, being manually overclocked too. Though with AM5 and AMD in general, you do have PBO or precision boost overdrive. So really you get some choices, which again is quite nice. Additionally, unless you really need that many PCI Express lanes, M.2 mounts and the 20 GB uh, USB-C, it is an overinvestment as they do add up to a significant lump of the overall cost. That being said, devil's advocate and stuff here, if you do need to build yourself a gaming PC or a rendering rig worthy of a demigod, I really can't fault it. It's well made, looks fantastic and is packed full of great features. And that about wraps it up. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And let me know, do you agree with what I've said about the Aorus Master? I've been a fan of them for every chipset that they basically made a board for, and this is no different. Yeah, so there you have it. If you uh, love what we do, then you can support us over on Patreon. The link for all that good stuff is down below where you get access to exclusive behind the scenes content, a monthly live Q&A session, special area on our Discord and bi-weekly game nights. It really is something uh, worthy to sign up for. So there you have it. I'll see you in the next one, guys. See you later.